The gospel lesson comes from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. It's the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount as well as the Beatitudes. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Okay, now you get to sit down, but I still don't. (laughs) So in these months, we have been looking at what it means to be called and what it means to follow the second person of the Trinity, Jesus the Christ, who has become incarnate, who has taken on human flesh and is now one person in one specific place at one specific time. And these two scriptures, um, if I could preach on them every Sunday, it would make me really happy um, because there's so much in them and they so are at the very heart of who we are. And so as we look at call and we look at all that can happen or all that can do, this is our purpose. Um, It is no coincidence that Jesus' first teaching here is centered around blessing and remember that this whole story started back when God called Abram into a covenant of blessing, that Abram would follow God so that God could bless him and through him all the families of the earth. And so we come now to Jesus Christ, God incarnate, and, and this is Jesus' first teaching, major teaching in the um, gospel that's according to Matthew. But he's already started his ministry. He's already been traveling through Galilee, meeting with people and healing the sick and bringing hope. And that has, that hope has now become more and more apparent as more and more people are sharing the good news that they have found and now crowds are gathering. And so this is the first moment where Jesus then publicly sits everyone down to teach them who he is and what he is about. Now we know that this, there would have been personal conversations happening all through this as Jesus interacts with the communities and the families and those who he's healing in their homes, along the roads, wherever they are. But this is that first sermon moment. And to fully understand its impact and the reversal that this sermon brings, we need to set ourselves back in that day. So we need to remember, if we step back, that we are not free people, that there is an occupying power, that Rome is present, and that Caesar is God, and and Caesar is understood to be the bringer of peace, the Pax Romana, that it is Caesar as God establishing peace throughout the land. But the people know something different, that there might be peace in terms of there might not be other countries coming in um, to occupy or to take over, but they know the heavy taxes that are happening. They know how much poorer they have become, and they know how hard it is to fight for their identity as Jews. And now there's a group of Jews called the Pharisees, leaders of the day, that have made a way for the people to continue to practice who they are and to claim their religion and their identity with God, even in the midst of being occupied by a power and says that he is God. And that's according to the purity laws. And they have this structure of if they can follow this rule of washing and interaction and this whole structure of how to be and how to not be, 
and to remain pure in who they are and their religious and their cultural identity. And that's a way that they can protect who they are in the midst of a time and a place that does not fully empower or allow that. And that was a great gift. The problem was it wasn't a gift that was available to everyone because you had to have a certain level of wealth to pay the temple tax, to be in right relationship and pure relationship with the temple and with others. And you had to have the time and the ability to not do jobs that would constantly make you unclean. And so if you were a shepherd, for instance, or a tanner, you would never be able to achieve what the Pharisees had offered. And so even in this hope and this gift, there's still distance and there's still pain and there's still a breakdown of it not working for everyone. And can you imagine the psychological effect of that on the shepherds, on the tanners, on those who can't afford the tax because they're already being overtaxed by the Romans and then the tax collectors who are collecting more from themselves and they're already struggling to feed their families and to survive? that not only can they not survive and have that struggle, they're not surviving and who they are in their identity. They can't live up to the spirituality they want to practice and do. There is physically not a way for them to engage their faith in the way that they want to. And here comes Christ. Here comes Christ with a message that opens up with blessed are the poor for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Excuse me? All of life, these people in the backwaters of Galilee, this is not a mega center um, of, of the time period. This is not a center of power or of commerce or of possibility. This this is not an important area. And into this area, Jesus comes and says, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Not the Pharisees who are following exactly the purity laws as they have been told, and that that's the way to usher in, and the Messiah will come the sooner, as soon as we can more of us follow these laws exactly. All of a sudden, these people are no longer the problem. Theirs is the kingdom of God. Now, Matthew changes this from the Lucan gospel that says, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Matthew says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And if you take both of those pieces and make a whole, it addresses both the economic issues of this group of people and the faith and the spiritual issues that they're following. So no longer, so blessed are the poor in spirit, Blessed are those who can't follow the purity laws even as they'd like to, even if they'd want to. Theirs is still the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who don't have enough, barely enough for their own survival. Blessed still are they even if they can't pay the temple tax. Theirs is still the kingdom of heaven. I just want us to imagine the relief that this sermon would have had. The flood of hope that would have been sent out from these words to the people who are gathered. Now, Barry, would you bring up the rest of our Beatitudes? Because it goes on and it builds on top of each other. And so we have a beginning with the blessing of those who now, who are told, did not have access to the kingdom of heaven, to the kingdom of God. Now they do in Jesus' words and in Jesus' teaching. And blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are devastated at the way that life is at the moment, at the injustice of it all, who are saddened and feel trapped. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. When you think meek, think of Jesus riding in on a donkey later on in the story and not a horse. Think of him coming in not as the military champion that they are hoping for, but as a baby, 
as the incarnate son of God who is vulnerable. Blessed are those who are vulnerable. Blessed are those who leave room for others, for they will inherit the earth. If we switch that earth and make it land, for they will inherit the land, the promised land that these people no longer have access to because of the warriors and because of the Romans who have come in in occupying power and taken it. Blessed are those who stay meek and leave room for others, who are willing to still be vulnerable even knowing the harm that it can cause. Blessed are those who don't adopt the practices of occupation and takeover that they have experienced and step into that cycle and that game of returning violence for violence. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Again, Luke leaves out the for righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, period. So again, we have the both end of the physical and the spiritual. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, for they will be filled. There will be bread that meets the exact needs. And we remember, right? This isn't just Jesus teaching and preaching this. He's already done that. He's already filled the hunger and the thirst and healing and being present with the people and meeting the real needs that they need. All of us, as we look at what our call is as people, as disciples of God, and how we engage in mission and evangelism, we learn here that we meet physical needs, that we be with people first, and then we add teaching on top of that so that our words are filled, that they are not empty, so that when we can meet hunger and physical hunger and thirst, we can also then take a step from that and hunger and thirst for righteousness and find that justice and that right living and that right relationship present in our lives. And then blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Right? Be the change that you want to see. That This is one of the most concrete and, and um, I'll say obvious ones of them all, if we want to receive mercy, if we want to be given a little bit of extra margin when we mess up or don't do things just right, the best way to ensure that is to then give that to others as we go through life together. I mean, granted, we don't have any trouble of that here at Epworth with our committee meetings and how we're figuring out everything together, right? We've already got that one. Um, it's hard. These are words that are not easy. It's not, it's one thing to know our purpose and then it's another thing to put it into action and to daily living every minute of the day. But just like the kids, that's what we do. We follow. We follow no matter how difficult it gets because of what is at stake. And so we know blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. So the more and more we practice this very hard work, the more and more we put it into our DNA physically and spiritually and who we are, then the more and more we see God, the more and more we look for God in our fellow congregants, in our neighbors, in our families, in our co-workers, in our city and the world, the more we see God at work, the more that we are open to and the more we are open to, the more God can do. And so everyone gets to grow and benefit and joy and hope. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. We'll hear more from that as we continue forward in this journey of discipleship and we think of Paul's letters and being called to be ambassadors for Christ and that that shows up and how we are reconcilers and how we work through our conflict and how we love our enemies, not just our friends. That is how we know that something different is happening. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so we have the ending caps, right, of the blessing of being present in the kingdom of heaven. 
those who are poor and who are poor in spirit, and those who are persecuted because of righteousness. We don't give up, and we keep following because we know what we gain. We know our purpose, and that purpose calls us through and keeps us on the road, even and especially when it gets difficult. And we will come up against at whatever age we are, whether it's at school or at work, we will come up against falsehoods and all kinds of evil being said against us. But those are the moments that we are called to be even more anchored in who we are. And not the bubbly kind of joy where we're clicking our heels and everything's wonderful and carefree, but the deep current kind of joy that anchors us and holds us. And as we feel the pull, because if you've ever gone and swum in an ocean, you know how strong currents can be, right? But we also know how strong God can be. Even when on the surface it doesn't seem like that's happening and there are sands and roving bands and we're exhausted and our camels stop, there is a deep current that is still at work, even if we can't see it. And so we come and we recenter ourselves and the purpose of our call and, and in God's presence with us so that we can remember and know that we serve Emmanuel, God with us. And that this, this way and this call and this following is something that God calls and sends forth for people of every age. We've just talked about what the disciples and what the people were up against, the crowds that were gathering around Jesus in this time period. But we started this service with the call of Micah. Because God had to send prophets, because when the Israelites entered the promised land and when they were freed from slavery, very quickly they became the Pharaoh and the hierarchical structure um, that they left in Egypt. And so then we have Jeremiah at the steps of the temple calling out the very place that was supposed to be looking after those who were most vulnerable in the society at that time, the widow and the orphan and the sojourner that were not being looked after and were in fact being extorted and the taxes and the work. And so Micah comes before as a prophet and brings a case, a courtroom case, not against oppressors, but against Israel itself and asks God to remember and God asks Israel to remember all that God has done and bringing them out of slavery and freeing them. And with, do you guys remember the story of Balaam and the talking donkey? Okay, you guys got to look it up if you don't remember. Okay, so God works through a donkey um, to protect the Israelites from being cursed. Right? This is good stuff. I can't make this up. Go look up the story. Um, and so to not forget, so there's a king who's so concerned about these Israelites that he sends a seer to curse them, but instead, the seer ends up blessing the Israelites. And so for all of the instances in our life where curse has been turned to blessing, and from safe passage from Shittim to Gilgal, we pray for a safe passage from Chandra, from Kir to India, this was safe passage for the Israelites and entering the promised land. Yet with even with all of these blessings, they were still unable to let those blessings flow through them even to their own people present in the land, let alone all the other families of the earth. And this is our human problem. We are too easily the stop instead of the flow of God's blessing. And so the prophets call at the time of Micah to come back to a covenant of blessing. And Jesus, in his very first sermon and teaching, calls us to be that blessing, to not be afraid of this call, but to know that wherever we are in it, there will be blessing. And that above all, that blessing is not meant for us alone, but for all the families of the earth. So Epworth, may we continue this sacred journey and this long work 
And may we be a community that God blesses as we just celebrated with our budget and the way that everything has come together, but that that doesn't stop and that we don't keep that just for us, but that we send it through us so that others might know the blessing that we know, so that others might know the hope that we know, so that others might have a taste of God's justice, of God's loving kindness, and what it is to be with Emmanuel, God with us. Amen.